let me introduce our, our, our guest tonight. So um, first we have uh, Professor Julian Evans, OBE, uh, who's a forestry commissioner and formerly Professor of Forestry at Imperial College, uh, previously Forestry Commission's Chief Research Officer. He's also a past president of the Institute of uh, Chartered Foresters, the ICF, and for more than 30 years, he's owned a 30 acre wood in Hampshire, um, sharing his knowledge with others. And I was lucky enough, one of the first things I did on my appointment was to go over to Julian's Wood and spend a day with him. And then a few weeks after, I spent a day with Julian and Carrie. So I've been very privileged <laughs> this year to spend some time already in Julian's Wood. Um, we also have Gary. Gary Kerr is the principal, principal silviculturist for forest research. And uh, I know he'll be very familiar to uh, RFS members for all the articles uh, he's submitted to the QJF, uh, um, uh, featuring the results of recent research. And for the last 10 years, his work has focused on alternative approaches to management uh, and continuous cover silviculture. He's also the editor in chief of Forestry, an international journal of forest research published by Oxford University Press. And he's also vice chair of the scientific advisory board for the European Forest Institute. I don't know how he's found time to join us tonight, but, but we're very happy to, uh, to have both uh, Gary and Julian join us. So welcome both uh, to, uh, to, and thank you for joining us tonight. So let's kick off with the sort of first um, sort of question really, which is, um, it's good to start with something uh, sort of fundamental. And the question is, what is silviculture? And to start us off, we're going to have a short clip of Julian. Um, so we'll see Julian on film shortly, hopefully, and then we'll, we'll take a few, take it from there. But what does silviculture mean? Well, we are familiar with the word agriculture, agri, field, the culture of fields. It's what farmers are doing all the time. And silviculture is no different. Silva, the word in Latin for wood, the culture of woodlands and trees. So anything that is to do with helping trees grow better, whether it's choosing the right tree for the right site, species choice, whether it's things like respacing trees that need some early thinning out or thinning itself, as in this lovely stand of 60-year-old beech trees that we are under, or there are silvicultures that we can say have other objectives, as well as timber growing objectives. There's silviculture that helps for wildlife, for biodiversity. So that was a, a little clip uh, talking about what is silviculture. So uh, Julian and, and Gary, so can you tell us what silviculture means to you? Well, first of all, can I uh, welcome everyone and say good evening to you? And it's a privilege to share with you, Chris and Gary, uh, this evening about silviculture. Really, silviculture is at the heart of what foresters do, unless we understand how our woodlands respond to the interventions we make. Um, and as I was saying on that clip, just like a farmer, um, you know, if we're not competent in silviculture, uh, really we will be more or less confident in caring for our woodlands. I'm going to share a few slides just in a moment, but um, I know Gary will want to, to chip in there as well. Okay, Gary, thank you, Julian. Yeah, okay, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to uh, echo Julian's uh, welcome and uh, thanks for being able to share this uh, evening with you. And uh, I hope it's gonna be fun and I hope we're all going to learn something. Um, my definition of, of silviculture is it's the theory and practice of controlling forest establishment, composition, structure and growth. And I think the key thing about silviculture is it, it's only the, it's the only way that we're going to adapt our forests for the challenges of climate change and all the abiotic and biotic threats that our forests face. Uh, so as Julian said, silviculture is the key discipline of forest management. I, I was thinking about this um, earlier today because I knew I was coming on on the uh, on the call, and um, as obviously it's not a, it's not a new subject, but it's certainly a sort of ever changing one, and it's 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 changed uh, over, over time. So um, perhaps Julian, you, could you just give us a, a little a bit of a an idea about how it has evolved over perhaps the last century or so? Yeah, and I'm going to share my screen at this point to. Uh, summarize it that way. Well, 100 years of silviculture, what can we say with this lovely view over Kielder Forest um, that you can see that's on the, the, the borders of England and Scotland? 
And that's to remind us all, 100 years ago, our forest cover was at around 5%. And since then, after the creation, the establishment of the Forestry Commission, afforestation initially dominated, conifers dominated. And indeed, we created very successfully a substantial planted forest resource. And over the next 30, 40 years, it led to nearly a doubling of our forest area. Um, and one of the consequences of all that was not only did we double our forest area, but we actually achieved one of the highest yield classes, average yield classes for a country compared with the rest of Europe. Our average yield class of 12, 13, 14 is substantially above France, Germany, um, certainly Scandinavia, because we've chosen the right species for the right site and we have a long growing season. But of course, things change and the shape and the appearance of these forests began to be challenged in the 1950s and 60s. We were planted right up to the, the edge of the fence and all the forest, the, 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 the walls and all, all the rest of it that one saw. And, and this simply was unacceptable in terms of a modern understanding of landscaping. And so one saw gradually a, um, a, a a restructuring, a remodeling. And this view that you can see that I took actually 30 years ago over Kielda shows that huge forest complex in that process of being remodeled. And then of course, further, there was further concern about amenity, recreation, the desire for big trees, for glades, for enjoying the nation's forests, um, as well as growing timber, uh, which, we, which we so much needed. Such that by the 1980s, there began to be uh, a return to a rediscovery, as I've described it, of broadleaves, because it had been so conifer dominated for the previous, previous 50 years, quite rightly, because softwood, which is what conifers produce, is our principal timber requirement. It still is today, but nevertheless, there had been a neglect of the broadleaf woodlands of, of, of our country. And Really, it was from the 1980s that um, there was a, a return to understanding silviculture within broadleaves um, and, and how better to look after them, as well as our plantation forestry with, with the conifers. Gradually, of course, other imperatives came, such as biodiversity and the work with um, restoring ancient semi-natural woodlands that had been coniferized, returning them steadily to other, uh, to their um, pre-existing uh, condition. Fortunately, in almost every case, the coniferizing element didn't actually damage very much the, um, the, the seed bank in the soil, and so that it was certainly something that was, was really helpful. And then from the year 2000s, we hear more and more about environmental services, the development then of continuous cover forestry ideas, how can we embrace these uh, better? And today, well, what, what can you add? Isn't it interesting how we understand that simply the enjoyment of our forests, the walking in, into our forests um, is good for our well-being. We all know, of course, from COP26, the importance that trees can play in helping tackle uh, the buildup of carbon dioxide. And here we are, 100 years later, back into a forestation again. So there's been a lovely um, as it were, completing of a circle in one sense, as we have another great hike in the area of forests. And just to re-emphasize, we have a worldwide reputation for doing tree planting well. And I think we shouldn't forget that and apologize uh, for it. Thank you. Okay. I will thank, stop thank the you. screen. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Julian. That's a great sort of quick sort of flyover over the last sort of 100 years to give us a bit of context for the rest of the discussions. I think before we go further, Gary, anything to add uh, to uh, to what Julian's just been covering, covering there? No, I, I think that was a really excellent summary. And uh, yeah, I, I, I think we've got all the skills that are required. Um, to basically meet the challenges, um, but we need more people. Uh, basically, in terms of this, this sort of like the skills crisis in uh, you know mm. in the industry to 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 carry out the policies that are taking shape, I think that's a really key issue. But it's nothing yeah. to do with silviculture. It, it's really interesting. So although you say we sort of come full circle, I so, say so. There's obviously we know now there's a there's a big push by policy makers 
um, to 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 increase the the area uh, of of cover, um, but it's for very different reasons, and that's sort of seen you know that's changed quite dramatically. And actually, in a relatively short amount of time, you're talking about really the last sort of thirty years, I suppose, um, forty years if you count the eighties, um, when that's sort of evolved and changed. It's going to be interesting how that will. Um, sort of evolve in the future as well. There may be new new benefits that we we don't even understand uh, yet that we can derive from from having uh, 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 woods managed well. So just on on that. So um, in terms of um, the latest thinking in silver culture, Gary, perhaps I can start with you. So where where are we going? What uh, do we need more silver culturists? <laughs> well, um, I think as uh, the comments from Julian and I made uh, at, the, at the start, um, everybody that's involved in managing forests should be a silviculturalist at some extent. Everybody needs to have a basic knowledge of silviculture. Um, and really, in terms of where we're going, uh, the key word is diversity. Um, you know, Julian's slides made very clear at the start that basically we were planting really single species, uh, even aged uh, woodlands uh, almost everywhere. Um, and, and, and to meet the challenges of the future, we have to embrace diversity. Uh, and that means considering a wider palette of species, uh, considering mixed species stands, um, and also considering a, a, a wider approach uh, to managing woodlands, not just thinning and felling and clear felling, but using some of these uh, other silvicultural systems, which can have economic and environmental benefits. Um, so I, th I think, you know, the future could be very exciting, um, but I think we have to balance uh, tree planting uh, with the care and management of our existing resource. And I'm slightly concerned that uh, you know, the emphasis is always on planting targets and things like that, but a huge proportion of the woodlands uh, in Britain are, are basically are, are unmanaged. And I, I think really for a number of reasons, that's not acceptable. Yeah, yeah that, can I, can so, I sort of get in there and, and underscore that last point that Gary makes? I mean, I, I think the figure that people quote is 40 to 50 percent of the woodlands are lowland woods. Um, are, are not managed in the in the sense of being used, being enjoyed, um, and I think that's important. I want to make another important point. If you go back to that first slide I showed of Kielda um, and the restructuring that that you could see in that picture and Kielda Water there in the distance, another major change is that we would not now want to plant the peatlands in that area, and indeed there is a deliberate step of restoring. The, the where you've got a, a reasonable depth of peat to pure peat because of obviously the climate change and, and the carbon storage benefit. And so we are seeing a refinement of where you would want to plant trees um, if one is using trees purely for, uh, for, for carbon storage and so on. And I, and I think that's an important point. The other in, in interesting point that sort of Gary alludes to is that the trees we have established, the woodlands we have, are expected to cope with a whole range of different objectives. They were originally growing pit props in the 1920s right. you know, for the mining industry. Well, we won't be growing any pit props in the, 20, in the 2020s, and yet it is the same trees and the same woodlands, and it's just fabulous that silviculture is all about delivering that diversity. Yeah, but that's one of the hardest things, isn't it? Because you, you're you're putting um, uh, sort of plans in place now that for for sort of 50, 80 years ahead, and you, and it's 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 difficult to predict what uh, what uses um, people might might want for the for the timber, but also for the, for the woods in other in other respects. And certainly, just to a, a third person to underline this issue, if anybody from the government is listening about the um, the, the unmanaged and undermanaged woods, because it's 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 definitely a key concern for the for the uh, for the RFS um, and it's great to see more planting going on but absolutely we need to manage the woods we have and of course if we're expanding that area then we're saving we're potentially giving ourselves a, a bigger headache in the future um, I think we should let's see if we go to some questions now so Wendy's popped yes. up. go on Wendy. Um, yeah we have one question in about pause this is from Scott Martin I think Scott hopefully you've been unmuted or will be unmuted and can ask the panel your question it's about whether whether pause is fit for purpose. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We can hear you. 
Uh, yeah, I was just wondering your thoughts on the pause policy and whether it's still considered fit for purpose, considering the, the need to grow timber, but also uh, in the face of climate change and, and pests and diseases, the, the suite of, of native trees that we have remaining um, is diminishing all the time. When you actually factor that in with putting the right tree in the right place as well, that, 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 that limits it even further. Um, and it was just to get your, your thoughts on that really. Okay, just thank you, Scott. Just to, just in case some people don't know what pause is, it's plantations on um, ancient woodlands um, is what what it, what it stands for, and there's a there's a policy uh, in in place in terms of how how they should be managed going forward. So, um, who wants to go first on this one? Gary, do you want to give us a thoughts on is it well, working? Um, I think the, the I mean the question's got a number of facets. Um, the most important facet is. Uh, protecting that area uh, of uh, ancient woodlands and ancient woodland sites uh, in, in, in terms of their area and their biological and environmental value. Uh, the second bit is actually how you manage them. Um, and I think probably what Scott is driving at, um, uh, you'll, you'll forgive me if that's not the case, is that there are now a, a large number of um, pests and diseases affecting native species and there may be a requirement in the future uh, to look at replacement species that have similar ecological functionality as our native species uh, as a way of maintaining the value of those woodlands um, uh, both in terms of er environmental and, and, and economic factors and uh, you know, if, if if the present policy and procedures doesn't allow that, then probably a, a, you know some sort of rethink might be required on that. Hmm. I, I, I think Scott, the point you uh, I expect you're making is that clearly, if one is removing a conifer element, um, there will be some drop in productivity. How does that match with our intentions to to storm uh, storm more carbon? Um, which I think is a very fair. A uh, very fair point, um, which I would set a, set alongside the fact that clearly ancient woodland sites is a limited resource. It'll never increase. There are some experiments that have been done by soil on soil transfer trying to uh, to do that, but that's going to be a, a very very limited. And so clearly, the emphasis on any new planting will be new sites to expand the, for the forest cover, and by definition that won't be on ancient woodland sites. But I think your point is well taken, that um, we mustn't overlook the fact that we want to be growing productive forests, um, as well as all the other reasons why tree planting has taken place. And I know a number of organisations, my own institute, the Royal Forestry Society, CONFOR, um, is concerned, that have we actually got the emphasis quite right in terms of the balance of growing productive forests, growing ones for um, the benefits of environmental services, of um, uh, you know the, 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 the personal well-being, you know the spiritual health, the mental health, and so on, and uh, yeah, and it's getting that right. And you know we're still in early days of this this huge uplift of afforestation, um, and uh, you know we'll, we'll we'll get it. I'm sure we'll get it right, but I, I think you make a very good point about pause. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you both. And it's uh, it's it's a really interesting area. And obviously, we're, we're touching into other areas in terms of there's always these different choices, and it comes down to what your objectives are. Obviously, that specifically with this question relates to designation of a site. And I was really interested to just get your thoughts on, on that. And of course, we know some of our uh, cherished native uh, uh, trees, our oaks and our ash, for example. Uh, have, have really suffered uh, um, recently, so there may be have to we may have to have some different uh, options in in the future, as, as Gary was saying. So it's an interesting area. Um, I hope that answers your question, uh, Scott. Um, Wendy, yes, do we? Okay, thank you, yes, Scott. Um, we have we have one other question in from Marilyn at the moment. Um, I think that might fall better into the next section. Um, okay. And so also Tom move. Bartlett's coming. So I think if we if we move now into the research and um, we'll we'll ask a few more questions in a little while. Sure. Okay. If so we, um, we're, yes, if you, if you put your questions be... in, I'm not ignoring them. They'll, <laughs> they'll they'll come up in the next sections. 
Okay, so well, keep your right questions, here. keep your questions rolling. So, so yes, thank you, Wendy. So we'll move now to um, talk a bit more specifically about um, uh, about research and and silver culture. And uh, Gary, can I, if I can start with you? So um, we know that the the, the, the last uh, sort of ten years or so, you focused on alternative approaches to to management. For example, we've touched on it already. That's continuous cover forestry. I think I said continuous cover silver culture. Um, so, so what have been the major revelations uh, for you from from that work that you've been doing? Yeah, um, it's the generic application applicability of these systems to a wide range of uh, situations um, in Britain. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I found this lovely quote um, from uh, a book uh, which I love, which is called uh, Silvicultural Systems. And uh, just to underline that, I'd like to, to, to read out what Leslie Troop said back in 1928. Um, which is that in Great Britain, the successful application of some of the systems, that's the silvicultural systems, would be impossible at present for two reasons. Um, in the first place, many British woodlands are in a derelict state through faulty treatment. And in the second place, the country is so infested with rabbits that forestry in any form is often difficult, if not impossible. Um, that, that, that was said nearly 100 years ago. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if you replace, uh, replace um, in, in what I've just read out, the fact that many stands are unmanaged or have very high base areas, and if you swap rabbits for deer, you have a fairly good uh, accurate representation of, of, of the situation that we have, as, as, as well as with grey squirrels. So, you know, these systems have, uh, you know, wonderful... Um, advantages um, in many situations and they can be very wide, widely applied. So that's that's really the fundamental point that we're trying to get across and our research is focusing on um, making, uh, you know, giving forest managers the tools and understanding to, to make that happen. Um, so for instance, uh, in the RFS uh, journal QJF, Recently, we wrote a summary of the work that we've been doing at Clackinog in northeast Wales, and we've been using different silvicultural systems to manage very successfully Sitka spruce. And uh, you know, many many people twenty years ago would not have thought that 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 would be possible. That you know, Sitka spruce is just a plantation species. Well, it, you know, it's not. Um, in the Pacific Northwest, it grows in a different, in a huge variety of different structures and situations, and we have to try and harness that in in the, the way in which we uh, manage Sitka spruce in this country. So we're learning new things, new things all the time. Do you think is there a, a bit of an issue? Is there is there a lag between um, what we're we're learning from research? Uh, work that you you and others undertake yeah. and the practitioners that that actually manage uh, our forests yeah um, and and it's 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 you know it's um it's it, it, there there is a you know a, a lag but um it's it, it's not a problem it's um you know it's it just requires uh, people to um, you know, read and understand, um, and and and, and th these things in forestry, uh, you know, take some time because we're not. We, it's not like medicine or something like that, which is rapidly evolving, and it's all in laboratory conditions and things like this. This is, you know, this is in the wider environment. Uh, people are often dealing um, in remote rural locations. Um, and, uh, you know, all these things are understandable, but we, we have to have sustained interest and sustained research to, 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 carry, to carry through. Yeah. Julie, do, do, do you want to add anything to what Gary's been um, Well, saying? yes, and, and I'd like to share another slide, if I may. And I should have shared with you before what is silviculture. My, my own summary, looking at this lovely picture from um, the Highlands of Scotland, oh. is it is an understanding of trees and woods and how they respond to achieve your hopes and aims, which is a, a simplified version in a way from what Gary said. But what about research? Where should we be going? What, 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 am I, what would I want to be seeing taking place um, in research over, over the next several years. And those of you who, uh, who know me and have heard my comments about this, I'm a huge fan of long-term experiments. 
And here is one that was laid down a number of years ago now. This is in Western Bert Arboretum. It's an aerial shot, as you, as you can see, of an EU-wide uh, program looking at new species for the 21st century and, and, and climate change. And you can see some of the winners and some of the, the ones that are not doing quite so well. And so I would want to see, do not neglect our long, our investment in long-term experiments in the past. They may have been set down for some objectives, but we can now ask new questions of them in many instances. And that reminds me, we shouldn't neglect those eminent silviculturists uh, who are still with us today. We think, we think of people like I say, Esmond, Esmond Harris, the late Bede Howell and his fabulous book. We were reminded of that at RFS Council only yesterday, or people like Geraint Richards, and all of you, uh, anyone else, you, you will be able to name those people who you can go to to ask about silviculture uh, and, uh, and so on. And, and in a way, it's the same with our um, bank of forest experiments that, uh, that uh, we have all over the country, which, which are there. So that would be point number one. But I think point number two would underscore Bar uh, Gary's comment. How can silviculture, the way we look after our trees, better address the threats of our time? We did a lot of research on Winthrow and we are far better able to manage our forests to make them a little bit more resilient to wind throw. But of course we have increasing temperatures and we have this increasing burden of pests and diseases. And what role does silviculture play as well as the actual individual research into the ecology uh, of those pests and diseases? So those would be the two issues. Don't neglect what we've already invested in. They can still help us. And also remember how silviculture become, if you like, a handmaiden of um, it's used to do with person diseases. So yeah, many things that one could say about, about research, but certainly um, those would be two key ones that I'd like to, to share with the, um, with the participants more widely. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. So um, I think now it might be a good time to go to, um, to a poll. So we can we pop a question up for everybody, and uh, and then you get a chance to give your give your view on on this, and then we can discuss um, what the results are. This is going to be quite exciting. We've no idea what uh, what results we might get. So um, Claire, if you're about, please could you post up the the first question, which is uh, so in your opinion, what area of silvicultural research uh, should be the priority over the next three to five years and you can only choose one option so the options are woodland creation alternatives to herbicides emerging species continuous cover or tree management such as coppicing and pollarding and you've got a few seconds left to i think to uh give your response I've just found out that the panelists can vote as well as the people. Oh, can we? Board. I did realise yes. that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, let's let hold a, hold ourselves in suspense. So there we go. It was quite a spread of. Oh, wow, that's interesting, answers. isn't it? That is interesting. Yeah. So, uh, emerging species looks like that one's a bit ahead. And and then woodland creation continuous cover, and then that they they've all got they're actually fairly even spread. I'm I'm surprised it's, it's uh, quite an even spread of answers. Do we, do we know how many people actually voted? It's a typical research question. What's the sample? <laughs> Fifty-seven people, Gary. Oh, right. Okay, so everybody's contributing about two percent. That's that that's very interesting. Yeah. 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 So, um, okay. So any, 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 but it just shows there's lots of things that you need to get on to uh, researching, Gary. <laughs> so well, it's, um, the, the, the interesting thing about that was that, um, you know, there's such a lot of emphasis at the moment about woodland creation and things like that, but actually it didn't come as the, I thought it would be by far the, the, the you know, the, the, the most popular answer, but it wasn't, uh, which well, I think it, shows it, that people have good balance. In one sense, we know how to plant and care for trees. I think the concern is, have we got the right palette of species for yeah. the future that we're going to uh, that we're yeah. going to have, and uh, and certainly that has I think come through 
perhaps even more clearly than, than one expected. And just to remind um, everyone that we in Britain have the best resource of any country in the world in terms of Arboreta, um, the pine eatums, the, uh, the, the, the gardens that are all over. And we certainly have, although we have a narrow range of native species, we actually have a terrific resource where we can see what, what potentially we can be using in the future. Yeah, uh, we maybe shouldn't be surprised that the species has, has come up, uh, especially from, you know, the, the audience that we have. And I, and I think we've got a couple of questions related to, to that, haven't we, Wendy? So We have. We've just had a little flurry of questions, so please keep them coming in. I think we'll try and go to um, three or possibly four people in this section. So I think first we'll go to Marilyn with a question about continuous cover forestry and exotics. Marilyn. You there? Uh, yes, um, continuous cover forestry has a, 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 so many merits going for it, particularly if we can secure long-term management, so it goes forward into the next century rather than into the next 10 years or so. Um, uh, and uh, already we, we can see in Germany that uh, their dependence on spruce, uh, the uh, climate change caught up with them much quicker than they thought, and it's now being decimated by bark beetle. Um, so therefore, you know, uh, a competition for tonight's lecture was won by the IDS on, for, uh, on species, uh, but um, <clears throat> uh, I have listened to John Anderson before, so uh, I was just wondering whether we can more incorporating some of these species in continuous cover forestry. And also, you know, if they're not invasive and a lot of species we know uh, just from arboreta some are invasive most are not but can we incorporate some of those even in uh, ancient woodlands okay well um shall I, shall I take the first question chris which was Please, really, yeah. re really about the applicability of continuous cover to the range of uh, non-native species that we have in this country and um you know, mo mo most of the species that we have used in forestry in this country come from the Pacific Northwest. And uh, out there, species like Douglas fir, Sitka spruce, western hemlock, western red cedar, you know, they grow in uh, different mixes depending on the site and the climate. Um, and they're also managed using, you know, a huge variety of different systems. So, um, you know, particularly the, the shade tolerant species uh, you know, are very applicable to 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 use with continuous cover. Um, so I think that's a you know that's a a definite yes um, in, in in terms of uh, the answer. But obviously, on some sites, it's easier than on, on other sites. And one of the things that we have to learn is which species works best on which sites in terms of continuous cover. Mm. And can and can I sort of uh, add a comment and. Merlin, are you the Merlin of arboriculture and uh, who uh, uh, we, we've corresponded old oh, oh, donkeys years ago? Yes, I edited the Arboriculture News for 15 oh, years. Well done, you. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, it's nice to be in touch again. Uh, and also the dendrologist, which uh, Sorry, uh, yes. folded, folded after 30 years uh, recently too, but mainly because I couldn't get anyone else to take it over. Oh, gosh. Well, well, thank you for all that you have done over that 30 years. Yes. It's been, been, been terrific. Um, the one comment I'd make about spruce in Germany is, is uh, very interesting in that over a hundred years ago, they had a researcher, called, a guy called Wiedemann, who was looking at why the second and third rotations of spruce on the same site were growing poorer and poorer. And it actually turned out that they had planted those spruce on sites for which it was ill-suited. And although there was a lot of pollution coming out of the Ruhr, it was actually principally that the species had been planted off-site. Now, I, I've seen a couple of recent lectures about the issues in Germany, and certainly much of it is driven by the huge droughts, I think, of 2018 and 2019, yeah. um, which led to that problem. But it underlines Gary's point, that is, it, it is the priority that we need to have of obviously the right species for the right reason on the right on, on, on the right site. And as was um, highlighted in the Birmingham conference last week, the role of mixtures, um, which I think we have neglected because of our push to get uh, a forest resource established quickly, um, is something that's gonna come back, I, I think much more. And there's increasingly good research to show that yes, mixtures 
and not only are more resilient, but actually probably a little bit more productive. And up until last week, I hadn't actually seen much hard data that was uh, showing that. Interesting enough, uh, I have a very old textbook here by a chap called Akers, who I think was the RF, RFS president uh, way back in the 30s. In 1938, he was recording experiments uh, from Germany where they showed that continuous monoculture was destroying the biodiversity of the soil. Hmm. So that's 1938, and he was recording that in this, I don't know if you can see the book, but right. uh, it's quite fascinating to look back. <laughs> okay. Well, thank, thank you, Merlin, for, um, for sharing that with us. I hope, I hope your question's been, been answered. Um, so we've got uh, some... Well, I, I would just like to follow up with that thing about, you know, how vulnerable do you think ancient woodlands would be to, if you included a few of these exotics, like Douglas Thur, for instance? Um, my own view about the ancient woodlands is that we, we concentrate on planting so much where we should be concentrating on trying to enlarge them so they were of a sufficient fry, uh, size. I mean, Rodney Halliwell used to say a minimum size of any management system is three hectares. And it's more or less the same sort of size uh, for good mm. um, you know, by ecology too. He was, Rodney Halliwell, of course, was an ecologist. So um, I think he yeah. had that in mind when he uh, it's, said it's, so it's, it's, it's this thing about uh, if we can enlarge it, cull the deer <laughs> or keep them out, as uh, Carl, anyway, I think is the most important thing, rather the same way as we got rid of rabbits in those places. Um, if we then, you know, not only can the trees regenerate, but we can have the recolonization of the ancient woodland plants. Yeah, I speak yeah, to the yeah. children, so obviously I have a okay. uh, interest. A certain, certainly, there's a very fragmented uh, picture, isn't it? And not just in mm. the children's across the country. So the sort of ecological connectivity is generally quite poor across most of the country so certainly extending yes. extending the, the the buffers and and, and the yes. areas would, would certainly help with that um but uh, so it's interesting the, the question is really about um how open we should be to introducing so it's a bit like the pause question uh to introducing a sort of non-native species possible sort of substitutes uh for the you know species that we will I'll have lost or will lose, um, and can they provide similar niches? That would be, that would be my sort of supplemental question to what Merlin's asked. Enrich is the word I think I'd say. Enrich rather than enrich. Not, and the idea would be enlargement is very important. So we get this recolonization, um, which uh, from the ancient woodlands into an enlarged area. Yeah. So, so just, I'd be interested if you, how many people have got an opinion. You know, how many experts, you experts have an opinion of uh, whether we could introduce some of these exotics in there safely. Can we, we just have a, we, we oh, thank you, Mel. We want to get some more questions here. So perhaps just a very quick response to that specific question, um, perhaps from Gary. Yeah, I mean, uh, we, we, we have a, a, an active program of research looking at uh, a wide range of, you know, conifer and broadleaf species. Uh, and looking at all sorts of factors in terms of, you know, um, growth, survival, disease resistance, and things like that, to, to, to make sure that we're screening species appropriately before they uh, have wider scale, more wider scale usage. Um, and we, 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 we've been actively doing that really since the foundation of the Forestry Commission, and, and people were doing it more informally before that. Okay. Thank you. I do want to move on to get more questions. So, um, Wendy is the next. Yes, uh, we have um, another question, I think, um, for this section, which comes from Simon Lloyd. I don't know, Simon, if you're there, about intimate species mixtures should fit in quite well with what we've just been discussing. Uh, good evening, Simon. Uh, good evening, uh, Julian and Gary. Uh, I'm just following up on uh, <clears throat> Julian's point about intimate mixes. We hear quite a lot about the benefits of. Uh, intimate species mixtures, but I wonder whether you could both give us an idea of the potential benefits, but also the potential pitfalls of adopting this approach. <laughs> it, it, that almost sounds like an exam question. Uh, describe the potential <laughs> benefits and the potential disadvantages of intimate mixtures. Uh, Simon, yes, thank you for that question. And, uh, and, uh, and so glad that you're able to um, 
uh, to be with us this evening, as indeed your presentation the other day at Birmingham. Um, clearly, the principal disadvantage, I guess, is economic because of the efficiency of harvesting and delivery of, 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 of log sizes and so on. Um, on top of that, surely the advantage is, is that it builds resilience, um, it allows um, more flexibility in the products you are you are producing, but certainly the skill of the manager of the silviculturist when you're doing your thinning, but also your planting in terms of timing of you know the, the plants coming into the site or the natural regeneration you're using. It is it is a more complex but ultimately more resilient means of grow, growing uh, trees and woods. Um, and I, I think is to be encouraged after the decades of um, focusing more on monoculture. Yeah, thank you, Julian. Gary. Yeah, sure. Um, sorry, my uh, connection dropped out there, so I didn't hear everything that Julian said. But uh, the key thing about intimate mixtures is that the species in the intimate mixture have to be compatible in terms of growth rate and shade tolerance. Um, and that's not always the case uh, with the combination of ev every particular species. Um, and uh, I'm an advocate of robust species mixtures such that they can grow in a compatible way up to the age of 20. So that if there's a period of neglect or something like that, that the, 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 the species composition of the mixture is preserved. Um, and in Quarterly Journal of Forestry in 2020, uh, I think in the April edition, there was um, the, there's some guidance there on how to choose compatible uh, species for planting in mixtures. Uh, and then it gives guidance in terms of the design of the mixtures for different species in terms of different size groups and different row row mixtures. Uh, so that might be quite a useful thing to look at. Okay, thank you, Gary. It's an interesting sort of balance here because I can see in terms of um, the the advantages in terms of things like resilience that you might get from from uh, adopting that uh, that approach, but versus the, the 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 skills capacity issue that has already been touched on is are we going to have enough people in the future? Do we have enough people now who who can manage um, uh, intermixes and other um, and other approaches that we might wish to to improve the resilience of of our woods? Yeah. So. Simon, do you want to come back on what's been said? Uh, no, I, I, I think, uh, thank you very much for your answers. I think we, we have had uh, mixtures in the past which have not worked well at all. Um, ash with, with oak, where the ash overtops the oak very quickly. Uh, nurse crops, which uh, have ended up being the main crop because no one's taken any, any, uh, the nurse out and so on and so forth. So we, we just need to be aware of many of the different the, the problems of, of mixing different incompatible species together. Could I, could I come back at that point as well? And and, and thanks, Simon, for that that remark. Um, there is there is no doubt that if one invests in a mixture, you must take the commitment to invest subsequently in the cleaning and the thinning um, for that mixture to to develop. In, in the way that one plans. Um, a few weeks ago, I was in Ampfield Woods, Forest Commission's Ampfield Woods, just near Romsey in Hampshire. And we were looking at 70 year old oak stands that are absolutely super today, that were actually began as an oak Norway spruce three row, three row mixture. The Norway spruce have long gone. They have served their role in um, some early economic return and in helping the, uh, the oak to grow. But today they are glorious oak woodlands. The interesting point about matching conifer and broadleaf in a mixture is that we came up, oh, this is a long time ago now, with a kind of rule of thumb where you've got a simple mixture of just two species that the conifer uh, predicted yield class shouldn't be more than about one and a half times the broadleaf predicted yield class. If it's more than that, the conifer is likely to outgrow um, the oak or the beech and so on. So it's one of those little sort of rules of thumb that's quite helpful, which absolutely underlies the point you make, Simon, about um, being sensible in terms of the way they need to be managed in the future. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Simon. Great question. And, uh, and thank you for the responses there. So um, do we, when do we have time for one more in this section? Um, I think I'm going to store them up, Chris, for the next okay. section. Okay. Uh, we're really <laughs> 
time right. and the rest of might, might come up really nicely in the next section. So I let's, think let's we'll move on. on. We'll move on to the next uh, section, which is about uh, interventions, which it, it's a, we've sort of been touching into this already, I think, haven't we? But um, so uh, I think to, to kick us off with this one, we've got uh, another little uh, video clip of Julian in his woods. One important aspect of silviculture is thinning. What you are doing is intervening in a stand to remove the poorer trees and favour the better ones. And for example, this lovely stem here is one that I would never want to cut. But you can see other trees that are poorly formed, that are growing less well, and you may consider cutting those out. Now I know, I know I've seen the, 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 the whole of the, the film and there's a uh, Julian, you go on to to say that uh, there's not really ever a sort of a, a, a sort of right answer or a wrong answer to, to to thinning. And I know this is a very it gets into quite a complicated question about how how you go about it and and what's the right approach. So um, yeah, I mean, some people might find it sort of unhelpful, and some people might find it very helpful. With you know, but what can you just expand on that in terms of is there a right and a wrong way to go about this? <laughs> um, yeah, I was going to show you another slide, my final slide, but in view of the mess I've made of the previous ones, um, I, I, I will leave, leave that one out. Um, why, why did I suggest that there's really no right or wrong answer? Well, it's the old one that if you've got three foresters looking at a thinning, you'll have four different possibilities of what you want to thin and you want to remove. And the most important thing is, is to be clear what your purpose is. If you know what your objectives are, what your purpose, what your aim is for, for your woodland, and for example, with broadleaves, if you're wanting to grow quality timber, you thin to the best stems all the time, rather than worrying too much about productivity. Um, if, you are, if your thinning objectives are, are, are different and you're wanting much longer rotations for the biodiversity that that will deliver, clearly that's going to influence it. Um, so in one sense, there is no right or wrong answer. Even if you've, you've agreed on the objective and several people agree on it, there will always be different ways of getting to that objective by the way you, you thin, your, thin your trees. The important thing I would want to emphasize is not to worry about what you're actually marking and taking out. Provided you are following a typical rule of thumb that you're taking out one tree in three or one tree in four in, in that thinning, it's not going to matter too much exactly what the choice is. Um, the important thing is actually to be doing the thinning, as we were mentioning earlier, something like 40 to 50 percent of our woodlands have been neglected and their main neglect is that they're becoming dark, becoming less and less useful for wildlife, for biodiversity, um, quite apart from timber products. So, um, yeah. So, um, so regardless of what you do, it's always better to, to do some thinning than to not do it. I, I, I think so. And I know you're going to ask a question, you know, what, what mistakes one can make, but I'll, I'll let Gary answer and then I'll come back to the big mistakes I've made. OK, I was going to I was going to ask Gary about the sort of um, how sort of recent research sort of um, links to this in terms of how we go about thinning. So is there anything you can share with us in terms of what yeah. we've learned recently about this? There's some very important things, and, and, and that is that um, if you look at the uh, Forestry Commission booklet 48, which is the yield models for forest management. A lot of the thinnings that are actually specified in those uh, yield models are either low or intermediate type thinnings, which are very, very conservative. Um, and uh, what, what's coming out of a, a lot of the work that we've do, been doing is the, you know, the massive benefits of crown thinning. Uh, which is um, the, using the approach that Julian mentioned uh, earlier, uh, which is to basically to identify your final crop trees as pretty quite, quite soon uh, in the rotation, uh, and then thin to basically uh, build crowns uh, and stability on those trees as early as possible. So it's, it, it's really the, the, you know, the, the much more wider scale adoption of crown thinning um is, is is really the, the the point that i'd like to communicate okay julie you were just showing us a book is this the book oh, that... i was just going even earlier than you it's the famous booklet 34 and the management tables and this is based uh, as gary was implying on um 
you know, uh, monoculture plantations um, with principally, um, which have been low thinned and, and, and so on. And so although they're a really good basis for us, um, I think increasingly we'll be moving away from this, the, the detailed assumptions in, in, in that extremely useful book. Yeah, I, I think now would be a good time talking about th thinning. It'd be a good time to go to the, the next poll and uh, give our, our audience a chance to, to give their view. So this is, a, this is a really good question. So here we go. It's up on the screen now, I believe. So, so intervention thinning. If you're planning to use continuous cover in the future development of an even age stand, which type of thinning will best serve this approach? And again, you can only have one choice. So no thinning. I think we've given a bit of a clue to this, perhaps <laughs> low thinning, intermediate thinning, crown thinning, or selection thinning, whereby a range of sizes are cut. So those are your choices. I'm intrigued to see what response we get to uh, to this. I've been barred from answering this one. Chris. Oh, you're not allowed to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, I can see we're not allowed to answer this one now. So there we go. I think Claire's fixed the, uh, the glitch on that. <laughs> Okay, so probably a few seconds left. So please um, make your selection and then we'll see what you've said and uh, take it from there. So it's probably gonna expire soon. There we go. And then the results should pop up any second. Ah, oh, okay. Mm. So, wow. so what have we got here? So the biggest response was about uh, thinning uh, whereby a range of sizes are cut, then crown thinning, and then a, a, a very a couple of people have um, have given alternative. Well, there's, um, there's no lag there, then, Chris. It's uh, everybody knows what the answer is. So it's fantastic, <laughs> isn't it? We gave them a little little bit of a clue <laughs> in, in the lead up, but anyway. But so you made you made the point very strongly about uh, about the the crown thinning. So um, is there anything more to say in terms of? In terms of this, and in terms, especially in terms of, I know it depends on your management objectives, but if we're um, thinking about sort of, um, so it, in terms of, you know, the, the newer objectives in terms of things like trying to make sure that the woods are multi multi purpose and they can do um, a bit of everything. Is there any particular? It's not. I know it's a too simplistic a question, but is there? Um, apart from the crown thinning that you've already described, is there anything more that we can we can think about in terms of how we go about this? Um, well, I, I suppose the you know the, the the key thing early on is basically to form some sort of organised access um, into into the stand uh, by by getting your your racks in. Um, and um, what, one of the great benefits of the timber market at the moment is that we're now getting good prices uh, for even small sizes of timber, whereas, uh, you know, many people on the call will remember the days when you couldn't really thin anything until the trees were really quite big because the returns were so, so small. So, um, you know, getting the racks in and at the same time actually doing tree selection uh, because in that early phase of growth, particularly conifers, can be growing extremely quickly. If you look at the top height age curves uh, in booklet 48, you know, some of the very, very rapid growth occurs for individual trees in the, in the early phase of growth. And it, it, if they've been thinned, then they'll put on diameter increment very, very quickly. Um, so don't delay is the other big message. It helps build stability, crown volume, seeding can make uh, plantations and woodlands look far more attractive. So the, there's so many very, very good outcomes from thinning. Okay, thank you. Thank yes, you, Barry. I'd like to un underscore that, that um, clearly because of prices, because obviously the, the, the firewood demand as well, um, one can be thinning perhaps earlier, even getting a cleaning being paid for, or at least its cost being covered. Um, but I, 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 I feel we've somewhat neglected what many in the audience will be um, responsible for, which are the larger conifer plantations, more in the uplands, whether it's Wales, nor, north of this country or in Scotland, um, and, and, and the thinning issues there, which are more driven by matters to do with wind throw, um, to do with uh, log size and uh, and so on, and we shouldn't shouldn't overlook that. I mean, it's been well researched, and I think we're in quite a strong strong position. But it is in 
often in many of those kinds of forests where the transition to continuous cover is actually now taking place. Um, I think Gary and I have tended perhaps to be, because of our own particular interests, as much on lowland broadleafs as, on, as, as those areas in the uplands. Indeed, can I, Gary, can you say a little bit more about continuous cover in uh, the conifer forests of the uplands? Yes, um, and uh, you know, other than the, the you know the, the the most exposed stands, uh, continuous cover is is as applicable in the uplands as it is in the in in the lowlands, mm -hmm. um, and the, the the key thing is to prepare the stands uh, by 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 thinning early and encouraging individual tree stability, uh, which is uh, essential. Um, and, uh, you know, sort of like no thinning re re relies on, um, you know, tree stability of the, of the stand rather than the individual tree. Um, so, yes, uh, it's, you know, other than on the, the, the most exposed sites, um, actually, um, once you've formed the continuous cover, um, actually, they can be more stable than, than, than uh, even age stands. So the, the, there's a very positive agenda there. But of course, you have to tread carefully. Mm. Okay, so Wendy, if we, do we have some questions? We do. We have a couple of questions specifically about continuous cover forestry. Right. I think perhaps if we go to Tom Bartlett first, I don't know if Tom's there. Tom's got a question about the bottom line. Um, right. Over to you, Tom, if you can, if you're unmuted. There we go. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, good. Yeah, good. Well, well, so Tom. CCS seems to be the future of British forestry or where it's going or at least where it's been taught at university, uh, which is where I'm at at the moment. And uh, I was just asking what evidence is there that the profit made from a stand managed through CCF can match or even exceed uh, a monoculture stand that you would somewhat see in, in the uplands? Um, and are landowners being persuaded to change? Because at the end of the day, they make the decisions on how they want their land managed. Okay, um, shall I take the lead on that one, Chris? Yeah, please, yeah. So really, uh, Tom, there's kind of like two questions there. Um, the first can be answered by, we, we actually did a study uh, where we modeled the growth of a uh, clear fell replant system uh, with Sitka spruce, uh, using it as a shelter wood and getting good regeneration and also, uh, also then, um, transforming it to a, a more complex structure um, and that's all written up and I can send you the documents about that if you e emailed me but basically the story was that um, if you take uh, the clear fell replant to be an index of a of, of 100 uh, then the, the the study showed that on an infinite series of rotations uh, that actually the um, shelterwood system with good natural regeneration could be about five percent better in terms of net discounted revenue. Um, if you go to a more um, a more complex structure uh, or if you don't get reliable natural regeneration and you have to plant uh, then it can basically be about 30 percent less good in terms of net discounted revenue. Uh, but of course, in those situations, there may be other ecosystem services which are being delivered in terms of being used in uh, a water catchment or in terms of biodiversity. So there's, there's very clear information now that um, economics or it isn't really or shouldn't be a hurdle to the adoption of continuous cover. And of course, one of the best ways of adopting to continuous cover is to do crown thinning. And that means that your thinning volumes and sizes will go up. So the profitability will be better. Um, the second uh, question uh, was uh, really about, I think, um, Tom, it was about sort of like a, a policy, wasn't it? About um, policy uh -huh. on, on continuous cover. I was sort of our landowners being persuaded successfully to take up CCF. Yeah, well, um, I mean, uh, various uh, forestry consultants that I know and, and, and have worked with for a long time, uh, you know, they, they, they basically sell, uh, you know, their sort of like uh, their, their, their services on, on, on the adoption of continuous cover and improving their, uh, you, know, imp you know, improving the economics. 
but I, I, I do want to just caution everybody that, uh, you know, continuous cover isn't some sort of wonderful panacea. And actually, the can, if you're looking at a more diverse landscape, actually some elements of clear felling can be really, really good for some types of uh, fauna and flora. And, you know, the, the famous ones are night, night jars and woodlarks, but there's lots of others as well. So, you know, clear fell, clear fell replant is a good silvicultural system. We mustn't rubbish it. Uh, but what we want is much more diverse use of these systems at the landscape level. Uh, just a couple of points to add to that, uh, Tom, from your uh, really good question. Um, both Gary and I are members of the Wessex Silvicultural Group, and there are several owners of large estates in central southern England towards the southwest who, in fact, are using very advanced forms of continuous cover forestry and appearing to use it uh, very successfully indeed, largely reflecting um, the economics of the price size curve. Um, rather than, uh, you know, the, the, the demand elasticity that one would have in terms of being able to sell the larger logs, helping to pay for some of the other thinnings and so on. Um, I mean, to be true, we haven't got all the answers, but certainly the uptake of the, it doesn't appear that uptake by owners is an obstacle to it being introduced. Uh, and I think that is probably the best test. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, so Tom. Yeah, great question, Tom. Yeah, Thank you. Um, and uh, great answers. So, Nick, uh, Wendy. Um, yes, any, we, any have, other... we have actually on that topic. Um, I'd like to bring in, if I may, Liam Plummer. Um, Liam, some of your question may have been answered by that, but Liam is wondering how you can make the transition to CC's F less daunting. Liam, do you want to um, ask the panel your question? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so it's actually, it was just today I happened to read a book that I think that Gary Kerr wrote, maybe 2008. And I think he used the term CCF's more about a range of approaches rather than systems. And I guess it could be quite daunting if you're used to quite a simple sort of cultural system. So I wondered if you could kind of talk about that and, and how, you know, this kind of quite complex and varied way of managing woods could be made slightly less daunting to perhaps people okay um, i'm going to jump in and stop gary answering the question just for two <laughs> seconds i asked gary exactly your question <laughs> my own wood which is a, a, an even aged beach crop and gary's answer was thin thin and more thinning over to you gary okay yeah i mean i was um uh, it, 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 it's a, uh, whereabouts in the country are you liam I, uh, I work in Yorkshire and mostly on ancient woodland sites. Um, yeah. yeah, okay, well, that, that's great. I mean, um, the, 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 the answer is very much in the vein of what Julian's been saying. And when people have asked me this in the, in, in the past, I, I, I say, keep thinning, shoot the deer, cull the deer, and aim for diversity and, 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 and make observations about how the stand develops when you're doing that. It's, it's actually when you when it boils down to it, you know, academics like me kind of like study it, but it's a very, very simple message in existing stands. Keep thinning, cull the deer, aim for diversity. Does that help? <laughs> I think, yeah, yeah, it's just um, it's just interesting how to kind of I think people could get bogged down in lots of different silvicultural sort of systems. Yeah. Which yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah that, I, 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 that's a very, very, very good point. I've got a great question for you, Gary. You, um, Liam's quoting something that you wrote um, 12 years ago. Has, has anything changed in terms of your thoughts on this? Um, uh, 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 yes, there are small changes uh, to it. And, you know, some of the guidance that we've written in the past probably needs to be slightly changed but um you know the main message that i've just been talking about mm -hmm. has not changed clearly um and i would imagine that lee i mean you, you, have you been looking at um what's called ogb7 managing continuous cover forests i um I'm, i wasn't totally sure if you said what it was that you'd been reading i think it was that one it was i think aimed at forestry commission staff um but i just happened to be having a glance for it today 
I mean, yeah, I mean, it's publicly available because it's um, so yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's that the, the, a lot of the information in there is still you know totally relevant. So if you if you've got any other questions or want to have a chat, Liam, just just let me know by email and we can have a chat and I'll help you out. Thank you very much. Thanks, thank you. Liam. Question. I'm Chris. I'm going to store another couple of questions up for the for the last and final section. So um, okay, should we move? We'll move on. We're, we're, yeah. we're, all, we're up against the clock a little bit, aren't we? So let's yeah. um, let's go straight into the the, the last um, section, which is all about sort of how silver culture can meet your needs. So we we have another another short video. Behind where I'm standing there is some ash dieback and we'll look at the trees just in a moment. But when we planted this area of woodland back in the 1980s, we planted some oaks, some cherries, but also quite a lot of ash. Indeed, something like 70% was planted to ash. And that is now what is suffering so badly from ash dieback, which we sometimes call Calara, or more correctly, Hymenocyphus. I'm so grateful that we have a variety of species. It's what today we would call resilience, so that the woodland is able to cope with new threats such as new pests and diseases. Okay, thank you. So a little, a little clip about uh, resilience and uh, giving me nightmares again from my previous job about ash dieback and all the problems that, that presents. So we, we, we touched on this a little bit already. And um, so, so, this is a, it's a big subject and we're not going to have enough time to, 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 to cover this uh, adequate effort in the time that we have. Um, let's just um, think about sort of uh, species choice as, as, a, as one that we know we talked about this in, in a different area, but thinking about um, resilience and thinking about um, how we might uh, prepare ourselves for, for the now, but also what's you know, the, the future scenarios in terms of climate and also pests and diseases. So any any thoughts generally about where we might go and, and what, 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 what the basis for making the best sort of choices uh, on that? Let's start with Julian, please. Can I, can I follow on yeah. from that clip? What I didn't say is that the ash component was 70% in that woodland that was behind me in that, that clip, and the oak and the wild cherry were both 15%. Um, so clearly the ashes is, is uh, the, the loss is, is, is more significant. There are actually some sycamores as well. Um, but much more generally, there are some good tools already available, such as ecological site classification that forest research um, have, have produced and has been well used over many years now. That would always today be a starting point. But I would set Alongside that, the National Vegetation Classification, which helps you indicate the kind of woodland that perhaps your complex of soil, site, location um, would, would be suggesting. But then to go even deeper into your silviculture, perhaps looking at books like Peter Savile's one on silviculture used in, 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 in British forestry, and recognize that there are some nuances. We tend to think of broadleaves generally more happily on neutral soils, even onto alkaline soils. And yet you've got one of the best examples of a tree that fails on alkaline soil, which is sweet chestnut. Whereas if you want to grow sweet chestnut, you must plant it on an acid soil of around pH 4, pH 5. Otherwise it simply won't grow. The coniferous analogy is if you plant Scots pine on a chalky soil, it grows for a few years and then will suffer lime-induced sclerosis from lack of iron, lack of manganese and so on. So there are those nuances. You've got different layers of silviculture in looking at how you build resilience, but the starting point must be the best matching of the species to the site, which is the mantra of the day, and it's absolutely right. Yeah, Kerry, do you want to follow on? Yeah, I, I, um, uh, the, 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 best, the best tools for species choice are, first of all, your eyes, yeah. uh, so that you should be on a site looking at what is growing there, um, and also visiting neighbouring estates, uh, potentially other areas where different species are growing, and making observations about how they grow. Uh, the second sophisticated piece of um, sophisticated tool that we have is a spade. It's very important to go and have a look at the site and the soils. As soon as you put a spade into the, the soil, to get start looking at the soil profile, you learn an awful lot about what species will grow there. 
Um, and all these things like ecological site classification, decision support systems, that they're only filters. Um, yeah. it's, it's, it's basically about site investigation. And the, the, I think the key thing about this is confidence. And it, it's better to do things. And by doing things, you learn. Sometimes you'll make mistakes. Don't worry about it. You've learned. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, we haven't touched on this subject, actually, that I think would be quite good to just talk about, about, um, about timber quality um, and how much people should be thinking about that in terms of um, sort of woodland management. So let's talk about timber quality for a little, little while. So, Julie, do you want to start us off with this one? Why should we care about the quality of our timber? Right. And I'm going to begin by talking about antiques. If you watch any <laughs> antiques program on telly, the expert will always say quality sells. And in general for broadleaves, that is absolutely true. Even the good quality, the green logs in, in, in conifers uh, similarly. Um, but in terms of your woodland management, um, if you're growing for timber, yes, always thin to favor the best quality. This is where the scourge of the gray squirrel is such a threat because while it may not actually kill the tree, it downgrades the quality from potentially saw log um, uh, down to perhaps firewood quality and, for, uh, uh, and so on. So uh, yes, in, in terms of broadleaves, try to thin to your best stems all the time because they don't naturally have such good form um, uh, and, uh, and obviously branch suppression and, and those sorts of things. But yeah, now that would be where I'd start. I can't believe we got to 20 past seven before the first mention of grey squirrel. That's that's <laughs> that's got to be a first. So we finally got there. <laughs> Harry, do you want to carry on about the quality quality timber? Yeah, I mean, um, quality timber is really the, the 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 most important thing is to have make sure that the species is growing well on the site and that it's matched well. Uh, you can't get quality timber if that that equation is not right. Uh, and then the second thing about timber quality is it's really about having um, enough uh, choice in terms of the stems that you've planted to select from. Um, and only with things where there has been a large amount of um, sort of like genetic selection, for instance, in poplars, can you really reduce that stocking density? And many of our species haven't yet uh, had that level of improvement. So actually, capturing the site and planting straight, regenerating enough trees to give the silviculturalist um, uh, some sort of like selection uh, for, for those final crop trees. That, that Those are the key things, matching the species to the site and, and getting enough stems on the ground. Can I, can I come back on Gary's own <coughs> while looking at the soil? Because there are some quality uh, elements to that dimension also. In, in case of growing oak, um, one of the depressing things is that when you come to fell the trees at 120, 150, you might find they're shaken. They've got these cracks uh, that run up the trunk, either following the annual ring or is a star emanating from the core. We know from um, research from a long time back that you get a much higher proportion of trees with that defect of shake on gravelly, sandy, light soils compared to the heavy soils of, say, Sussex and uh, central southern England, or the, or the wonderful oak growing soils of the Welsh marches and, uh, and that part. And so when the forester said, ah, that's good oak soil, what he's basically meaning is that it's good heavy soil and it's unlikely to produce shake. Another example, um, going to ash, um, is that you're to get black ash on relatively wet sites. And, and though there are those associations, which is you know, really getting into the detail of, of, of the silviculture and, and linking to quality. Yep. Okay, thank you. Just, just one final question from, from me, um, and um, just a little bit about the link between biodiversity and resilience. So I think this is quite an interesting area to just touch on. Gary, do you want to say a few words on that? Yes, I mean, um, the sort of the, the, the key driver about resilience is really diversity. And I think if you have species diversity and structural diversity, particularly at the landscape scale, um, I think you'll also get uh, biodiversity enhancements as well. So I think they basically go together. 
Um, and what, we're, what we want are sort of like fully functioning forests, which are diverse at the landscape scale and the resilience and biodiversity really go hand in hand, I, I, I think, on, on a number of different levels. Yeah, I mean, one of the, um, the key elements of enhancing biodiversity is greater variety of structure edge effect and in fact things like continuous cover or well thin woodland with lots of dapple shade and glades you actually are increasing the proportion of edge and so you're getting your habitats layers uh, present and so that that will lead to to a diversity e e even in a uniform beach woodland um, because beach is so shade tolerant you can actually have small beech trees big beech trees and you're getting a bit of structure even in something that is actually there even age but but no i mean the link is yeah. clear Absolutely. You're on my home turf now. So uh, absolutely what you just said is, is generally just a, um, I think um, we're, we're just about out of time. I don't think we've really got time for um, is there well, is there maybe perhaps one good grounding sort of question, Wendy? I don't know. Um, well, we've got a few and I'm really sorry to people that we're not going to get to. I think maybe um, if, if Sophie is still with us, Sophie is talking about something um, about how we can get new practices on, on the ground. Perhaps that's a good one to, to, okay. to end with. Okay. Sophie, are you there? Uh, Sophie's not unmuted yet. Hi there. Thank you. Hello. Hello, Sophie. Hi, mm -hmm. a great session. Great session. Thank you so much. I'm working in agriculture now, and I think there's uh, very strong parallels, aren't there, with the urgency of looking at mixed farming and diversity, but maintaining productivity, and then all about the uh, willingness to take risks and try new things. So my question was, whilst fully respecting the need for long-term research, Julian, and also, Gary, your earlier comment about um, being relaxed about the conversion of research into practice, and also knowing that the RFS Journal does a great job in that. I mean, nevertheless, I can't help asking you, is there not a need to, to look again about how quickly we can get good practice or good enough practice for climate resilience to be much more uniform? Uh, just loop it back to your earlier discussion about uh, the extent of under management and just the urgency of, of what we're going to do in our woods in the next, um, in the next 50 years. Gosh. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's a really, it's, it's actually a, that's a tr that's a tremendous question, and I think um, all the all the levers really need pulling in terms of incentivizing those sorts of changes to happen because it is a climate emergency, and mm. uh, you know we do we do need to start doing things, um, talking just keep talking about unmanaged woodland. We've been doing that for twenty years. We need to get it managed. And we need to get sensible management plans in place um, and, you know, incentives, um, uh, you know, that's important uh, as, as well as policy. So there's a whole sort of like suite of things, I think, that need to change to, to, to make things move quickly. Um, Sophie, yes, thank, thank you for that. One almost has to be evangelical in, in the sense of communicating your point. One of the real pluses of the suite of new support that the government has announced over the last six months is indeed to try and address just that issue in terms of developing plans that will allow people to, um, uh, to manage their woodlands uh, better. Um, and, uh, and I think there has certainly been a policy response to try and go in that direction. But I think all of us today um, and, uh, and the society more generally, as well as our profession more generally again, uh, needs to continue to make that, that point. Um, but it's certainly well taken and a really good one, I think, for us to round off our evening of silviculture and perhaps to be a prelude for any, another evening of silviculture next year or something. I don't know, Chris. <laughs> uh, I think I think with so much to cover, we, we probably need Mark too, don't we, in the, in the future? Yeah. So we do need to wrap things up now, I'm afraid. But thank you, Sophie. Great question. And a really good one to finish, as, as Julian just said. So it just uh, uh, rests with me to just to say thank you, everyone, for uh, for joining us tonight. I hope uh, everyone's in, enjoyed it and, and learned something. Thank you to our two guests, Julian and Gary, for uh, your brilliant insight into a fascinating subject. And thank you to my colleagues, uh, Wendy and Claire. Um, look out for future events. If you go on our website on the events page, um, there's, there's always uh, something exciting 
coming up so please look out and who knows we may have uh, silver culture evening uh, number two uh, sometime next year i've got thumbs up from gary at least, and, and i think you as well so we'll, we'll see because there's so much to cover it's a very exciting time for the for this subject so um uh, have a good evening everyone and uh, uh, good night yeah thanks everybody thank you all